apakah hasrat anda terhadap politik di negeri Melaka dan juga negara Malaysia secara umpamanya? What, what is your wish? I'm looking forward for a stable government. Saya rasa saya, this is not only me lah, menemukan hasrat untuk semua pengundi-pengundi dan juga penduduk uh, seluruh Malaysia. We need a stable government di mana kita mempunyai uh, kematangan dalam membuat uh, keputusan dan pada masa yang sama kita juga membuat mempunyai kematangan dalam mengambil uh, mengambil uh, taking up a stand on policy matters. So which is where which is where it is very much lacking. Let it be in the state level ataupun in parliament level. So that is my my hope and request. So Nana pula apakah, apakah hasrat anda bukan saja untuk negeri Melaka tapi negara Malaysia. Okay, um, sejujurnya Nana memang nak tengok kan perubahan di negara kita Jadi um, dengan adanya di Nana dan dengan adanya Danish uh, sebagai calon Ia bukanlah satu peluang pada diri kita untuk elevate atau personal stepping stone Tapi macam Nana cakap awal-awal tadi, ini merupakan uh, tanda aras untuk semua anak muda bukan cuma untuk memahami politik tapi juga untuk buktikan kepada semua orang kat luar sana yang walaupun kita ni tiada cukup pengalaman ataupun kita ni terlalu muda tapi kita mampu mentakbir anak muda mampu memimpin dan juga uh, anak muda sendiri mampu menjadi contoh dan anak muda mampu membuat perubahan jadi kalau tanya uh, Nana apa hasrat atau visi Nana untuk politik ni Nana memang nak ramai lagi anak muda untuk bersama-sama um, setai politik dan kita lakukan perubahan kita mengamalkan okay. politik yang berteraskan nilai Therefore we should stay well away from them all the Muslim scholars of the past have advised us that the person or the one who knows not and knows not he knows not These are people who are worse than donkeys. Well, first of all, Islam is not a religion for fools. These people are fools. Therefore, they shouldn't think that they can use religion. And if I say them or these people, we're talking about the government of the day. Whether it be this government, the previous government, the government before that, all of them come from the same cloth. They don't listen to advice. They don't want to listen to good advice. They think they know when in fact they don't know and they refuse to admit that. That's that's what we call arrogance. When you know not and you know not, you know not, you are arrogant. Therefore, we should stay well away from them. All the Muslim scholars of the past have advised us that the person or the one who knows not and knows not, he knows not. These are people who are worse than donkeys, obstinate, and therefore stay well clear of them. And yet here we are putting them as a part, as our leadership and our government. It's not right. What kind of a people are we going to become? I mean, look at the whole, the whole uh, political instability in this country. It's a racial, racist kind of thing, and it's not right. We deserve better.
Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of What's Going On Malaysia. My name is Harith Iskandar. Uh, terima kasih sekali lagi kepada anda semua yang dah menonton sekali lagi on time. It is 9 p.m. on a Sunday night, uh, 28 hari bulan November. Thank you everyone for um, catching this live streaming, whether you're watching it on Facebook or on YouTube, or even if you're listening to this after the fact on Spotify, thank you for being part of the program and thank you for um, your time. Most of all, your time. Dalam waktu dan zaman ini memang masa tu menjadi sesuatu yang kita tak boleh membuang saja. You cannot just throw away time. But upon saying that, I'm not going to be one of those people that talks for minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes and then at the end says, dengan tidak membuang masa lagi because that is that's just totally totally not happening first of all thank you for watching guys i know we always have so many viewers cho ping ping hello thank you cho ping for coming in yuli ku we deserve better i don't even know what you're talking about yuli of course we deserve better but that's what we will be talking about i i i'm not so sure if what we have is not good enough, but we'll have a look at that. Uh, Andrew Young, a good evening. This is an interactive show, ladies and gentlemen. Please add in your comments, add in your questions during the show. My producer might and will bring them up and we will uh, address your suggestions, your comments, your uh, ideas. Just, you know, throw it all in. It's interactive because tonight we are going to be talking about uh, an event That happened a couple of weeks ago, the Malacca elections. Um, This was a sort of a by-election that came about because of uh, early incidents where uh, members of the uh, ruling party of Malacca at that time uh, pulled their support away from the chief minister of Malacca and yada, yada, yada. Do I need to go into all the details? But the elections were held and the results, uh, for, for a fact, you can say were unanimous. Uh, And by that, I mean that uh, Barisan National completely walked away with it. Uh, I don't even know if walked away is the correct correct way of saying that. But uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, And uh, the the individual, my guest, uh, who uh, is going to come into the studio right now is probably... uh, one of the most important people that I can think about, think of that um, would be able to comment on this event, this incident, and how it sits into the future of Malaysia. He is someone who probably has the widest knowledge, basically in terms of statistics and research. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome into the studio Anche Ibrahim Sufyan, who is the director of programs of the Medeka Center Uh, Cik Ibrahim Sofian, apa khabar? How are you, sir? Okay. Sorry, let me just unmute your mic. Okay, you have to unmute your mic, sir. Okay, yeah. There apa you khabar? go. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Welcome to the show, uh, Ibrahim. Could you just take uh, 30 seconds to a minute to explain to everyone what is Medeca Center and why... Uh, you, out of many, there are many people who can talk about this issue, but why you are someone who has uh, some kind of knowledge and uh, information to talk about uh, the results of Malacca. Please, sir. Yeah. Well, Malacca Center is an opinion uh, research uh, group. We conduct surveys among voters, among customers, and among the Malaysian public. Uh, and our focus has been looking at policies and politics as well. So we've been doing this for the last 15 years. And uh, we've looked at uh, nearly all of the elections that has happened over the last 15, 18 years. And uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, by no means do we have the monopoly on information, nor nor do we have the monopoly on accuracy, because sometimes uh, we get it wrong. Like in Malacca, you know, I'm happy to tell you our experiences there uh, in terms of how Malaysians uh, behave when they go to the ballot box, what thoughts and motivations they have in mind uh, and then how they translate their feelings and thoughts into that particular cross or tick on the ballot paper. Okay, so Fan, before we jump into the details, uh, we, I'm just I'm going to bring up the 
the results, just an overall um, look at the results. Uh, here we go. Okay, so yeah. for those people who may not know uh, uh, the elections, here are the results. Barisan National won a whopping 21 seats, and the only other seven seats, two went to Prikatan National and five went to uh, the Pakatan Harapan uh, Coalition. So that's the results on papers. And uh, just a quick mention, if you look at the previous election that was held there during PRU 14, um, it was you know almost evenly split where Barisan National only took 13 and uh, uh, the Pakatan Harapan Coalition had 15. So you can say that in a good three years, um, much seems to have changed. Now, Chair Sufen, let me, uh, let's start with the past now. Uh, did you expect this kind of result from your uh, To be honest, no. To be honest with everyone here, no. Um, you know, we were looking at the election very carefully. We had some colleagues who were on the ground. We were looking at past election results. We ran some simple surveys on the ground. And what we found uh, were a couple of things. Number one, where we got it right was we knew that a lot of people won't make it to the election. Many people tak balik kampung lah to vote. Yeah. Uh, but we also know that uh, some voters have shied away from Pakatan Harapan. Especially Malay voters have uh, shied away from Pakatan Harapan. Uh, and they seem to be going to Perikatan National and back to AMNO or Barisan National. But what we didn't know was to how 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 much, to what extent would they uh, go back. And so, you know, just the day or two before the election, when we were looking at our estimates from surveys and uh, discussions with people on the ground, we thought that we think that Barisan National will do better than last election, but maybe they might fall short of a few seats, maybe one or two seats short of winning. And what we did find was... Uh, in Malacca, there are 28 constituencies uh, and we found that nearly 10 of these constituencies, 9 or 10 constituencies, it was very hard to say how the votes were going to play because the margins were very narrow. We have three big coalitions, three big parties contesting, we have independent candidates and other parties. Uh, so we thought that the margin was going to be narrow. So very hard to tell in a survey. And that's how it played okay. out. Uh, it, it did play out, but uh, number one, let's look at a couple of deciding factors. I believe that the uh, percentage of voter turnout was lower than uh, PRU 14, if I'm not mistaken, around the 65% mark, mm -hmm. which, um, you, you know, is fairly low because you, that's basically 35% of the voting public didn't show up. So all yeah. the um, all a party would have to do is uh, to to focus on that 65%, uh, yeah. which uh, if you break it down um, and all you need to do is win 50% win of the 65%, you're looking at less than 33.5%. I'm amazed at my maths. I, I don't even yeah. know how it came out with that. <laughs> so terrible at maths in school. So do you think this, let's, let's deal with each um, deciding factor at a time. Lower voter turnout. Did, it, did this, was this important? Did this really, really play uh, a huge role in the results that came out? Yeah, voter turnout is very important because we know from past elections and we know from even this election, you know, after the election has been concluded, that, you know, we Malaysians uh, are different in many ways. Certain groups come out to vote unfailingly. Older voters, you know, this Saluran 1, Saluran 2, uh, come out to vote uh, every election. Younger voters uh, turn out less in a normal election, partly because they don't live in Malacca. They may be working in Singapore, they may be working in KL, and then uh, they are concerned about the pandemic. So maybe some people uh, took the precaution, maybe I, I don't want to come back. And then number two, the second factor is ethnicity. So the culture plays a role as well. What we found was uh, amongst the Chinese voters, for example, uh, because Chinese voters are important, they make up about 31% of the voters in Malacca. Uh, their turnout was only about 55%. Uh, and that explains why uh, the DAP lost quite a large number of seats uh, in this particular election. Uh, for the Malay voters, the turnout rate tends to be ordinarily higher. Uh, so in this particular election, we estimate that the turnout rate among Malay voters is about 72%. So, it, so this is still 
10% less than GE14. But it does make an impact uh, when, uh, you know, the, the Chinese votes are low, but the Malay votes are slightly higher. Then uh, the Malay candidates, the Malay parties tend to do slightly better. Lah, you know, so that's why we saw AMNO do quite well. Because out of that 71% of people, uh, Malay voters that came out, most of them, many of them are their supporters, you know. So not only, you know, when you say uh, just you need to focus on that 65% of those that showed up, but also the hardcore supporters. And AMNO or Barisa National being uh, such a old party has been around for a long time, they have the system, they have the mechanism to identify who their supporters are and they can send message, SMS or WhatsApp, ask them to come up to vote. And so their turnout rate among their own supporters are much better than that of the other parties. So it's as much about strategy as it is about um, uh, doing something for the people or focusing on the, the rakyat in general, isn't it? Would that be a fair statement? Well, I mean, it's about the art of winning an election. You know, you know who your supporters are. You make sure they show up, you know. So it's just like you have a kanduri uh, and you want to make sure that all the tables are filled. You make sure all your relatives and friends show up, lah, you know, the people that you know. <laughs> uh, so it's just like that. Okay, I just want to go back to an earlier statement that you said that Malay voters have shied away from Pakatan Harapan. Uh, without going to stats, um, why why would you say that has happened? Well, you know, uh, Pakatan Harapan, you know, contested this election pretty much by itself. You know, it's basically DAP, PKR and Amana, the three core parties of Pakatan Harapan. You know, last year after the Sheraton move, Bersatu left. Uh, so we do know that all these parties, you know, they bring their own blocks. They bring their own supporters and, and yeah, the sympathizers uh, to vote for them. Uh, so from past election results, we know that, you know, Pakatan Harapan or rather PKR, maybe they have between 10 to 15 percent of the Malay voters in Malacca, in the, in the Malacca area. When they teamed up with Dr. Mahathir and Mohyuddin, uh, as part of Bersatu back in 2018, these guys brought their supporters as well. And there were also some protest voters, Malay voters who typically vote Barisan National, but maybe was unhappy over the issues back during 2018. They were angry with Najib or GST or what have you. And so they launched their protest vote because maybe they trusted uh, Dr. Mahathir to kasi chan lah Mahathir. But now that, you know, Pakatan Harapan has gone back to the core parties, so, and then, you know, Perikatan National is contesting, you know, as the third force, uh, many of these Malay voters who want to vote for a Malay party, but maybe still not ready to vote back Barisan National, they, they went and vote for Perikatan National. And so, the uh, we expected that there'll be some shrinkage lah amongst the Malay support for Pakatan. But we didn't think it was going to be that much. We, we thought that there's going to be a one-third reduction, but it turns out that the reduction is more than half. So it's quite fatal. Lah. You know, that's why they didn't win any seats. Wow. Okay. Um, do you think... Let, you, you brought up Najib just now, uh, Dr. Sri Najib. Uh, I mean, just overall, there seems to be a huge shift in the public perception, public uh, opinion. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you follow the social media and you read the, the, the writings on the wall, there, uh, he's, he is acknowledged to have played quite a huge part, especially in Malacca, in terms of what looks like a very huge shift towards back towards Barisan National. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, you know Dato Sri Najib played a very interesting role in this election because, you know, he is the kind of prominent face of the Barisan National campaign. And he was also the object of the whatever little attacks that Pakatan Harapan mounted, all the criticisms during their social media campaign, you know, they attacked Najib. Uh, uh, and I think, and this is where I think Najib is an interesting political character because Najib enjoys very high support within the AMNO and Barisan National hardcore. So the Malay voters that support Barisan National believe that Najib is innocent. He's been fitnah, lah, you know. So that's the narrative for them. And so for them, uh, they will come out to vote for Najib, just like, you know, Anwar Ibrahim supporter supported him through thick and thin during his uh, trials and tribulations, you know, back in the day. 
So Najib is similar in that sense. His supporters have come out in force for him. But for other people uh, who didn't support him, uh, they they were not, uh, I would say, attracted to him, but uh, they were also not attracted to Pakatan Harapan's message because actually if we watch the, how the campaign unfolded, what, what you know, it wasn't much of a campaign, lah, to be honest, you know, because it's all on social media. Uh, Pakatan Harapan was not able to really articulate the issues that Malacca voters cared about. Uh, they they criticized the rivals, but they didn't get a lot of chance to speak about what is it that they want to do differently, you know, if they were given a chance to lead. Did they connect with the voters in terms of issues that mattered to them? Uh, that was the challenge, when, and that didn't come out. So I think Najib just absorbed a lot of the attacks by the competition. Uh, and meanwhile, the Barisan National Communications Missionary was still able to put uh, their messaging out. They were able to portray their candidates' lineup, which is quite interesting. 86% new candidates from uh, BN. So a lot would of pressure. Say, uh, just going back to what you're saying earlier, would you say that the opposition's attacks on Najib uh, actually benefited? Barca National to some extent? Um, it, it had no effect. You know, it, it no, no effect. It benefited Barca National in an indirect way because um, they used their bandwidth to attack a negative that was no longer relevant to the context. And that bandwidth could have been used better by channeling their positives and their plans for Melaka. Okay. Um... I just want to bring back this comment that came up earlier from Aznur Muhammad. It says, the next G, people will vote for BN as they want to feel the stability of what uh, BN had provided for 60 plus years. If PH can't capitalize on this loss, uh, they will lose even more. Now, I find this uh, comment an interesting, very interesting, and with a lot of plausible argument to it. What do you think? Well, I think there's some truth to that because I think Pakatan Harapan you know, has had his brief stint in federal government. So people are aware about Pakatan Harapan. So uh, for PH, which is now in the opposition, it's very hard for them to just uh, promise things because they've already, people can see uh, what they're made of. Uh, and therefore, uh, they need to address the problems that cause voters to shy away from them. Uh, and I think that first problem is to ensure that they have a wider representation of leadership that covers the voter segments that are critical. So they need to cover Malay voter segments more effectively, especially uh, younger voters, women voters, particularly people who are not so sold on ideology, but people who are more concerned about uh, practical issues. So they, they need to go there. If they don't articulate uh, their plans for the future and how they have ideas that can fix Malaysia, then I think voters will go for the devil that they know, you know, flawed as it may be, at least Barisan National, brings some stability, brings experienced people, uh, and brings uh, people of the same skin colour that they trust. Okay, now let's talk about this. Uh, and I think I think this is the crux of the matter. Uh, just after the elections in Malacca and, you know, the final results are out, uh, it seems as if BN uh, have almost said, hey guys, we can do this on our own. We don't need Prikatan. We don't need Bersatu. Uh, um, let's jump straight into GE15. In a nutshell, do you think this result in Malacca is an, a signal of what is to come in GE15? I uh, you know, Haris, I think it is a partial signal. It is a signal that uh, the promise of the opposition uh, is is fading. You know, uh, the opposition has serious problem. And I think Barisan National can take advantage of that. Is Malacca election a bellwether, uh, an indicator for the whole country? I think no. But Malacca is an indicator or bellwether for West Coast Peninsula Malaysia. So if we look at uh, seats, yeah, if you just imagine uh, Malaysian geography, from Kulim all the way down to JB, you know, as far as the North-South Highway stretches, that whole stretch of mixed ethnic seats and all that, this is somewhat uh, reflective uh, of that. 
when you go to other places of the country, Sabah Sarawak is different cattle altogether. Uh, and in the Malay states like Kedah, Terengganu, Kelantan, to some extent Pahang, I think there's something to be uh, watchful there for Barisan National because when we look into the details of the results, so not the big picture, 21 seats won, you know, landslide, blah, blah, blah. But when you look into the de- a little bit of details, I, I wouldn't, you know, bore the audience with statistics. Lah. But I just want to tell you that out of the 21 seats that Barisan won, only seven was won with 51% of the votes. The rest were all won under 51%. So they won with, you know, I think about, on average, the popular vote was only about 38%. So, which means that Barisan National didn't actually get a lot more votes. It's just that the, the rivals, the competition was split. That's one. Number two, even more detail, when we look at the Malay areas, uh, the Malay constituencies and look at the ballot box, yeah? You know, people vote by streams, kan? Saluran, and then you go to the ballot box. And interestingly, all these ballot boxes are arranged by, by age groups. So, the younger age groups... Younger Malay voters lah, uh, saluran 5, saluran 6, so that means below 30 years old, many of them gave votes to Perikatan Nasional, whether bersatu or PAS. So if in Melaka, these guys got about 45% of the Malay votes or nearly 50% of the Malay votes, can you imagine what it's like in Terengganu, Kelantan, Kedah? Probably PAS will capture more seats in those places. So they need to go into the details because come next year, January, we'll have only 18. I think younger voters tend to be more anti-establishment and BN is the establishment now. So there'll be some challenges ahead. So, yeah, that is a question uh, that's brought up here by Anwar Hazik Razmi. Um, how you think under 18 voters will impact the next G15? Are there any data or surveys to show which party would have an advantage? Uh, expanding on what you just said? Yeah, there is some data. Uh, Unfortunately, it's not being made widely available to the public by the election commission. Uh, we've gotten bits and pieces of this uh, from people who contested in the election. What we found was, like I said, in the younger streams, meaning uh, younger voters in the Malacca election, more of the younger Malay voters actually gave votes to Perikatan. And in the few seats where past contested, they actually got a big chunk of the younger Malay votes. We suspect and, and for this, we draw upon some of the surveys that we've done uh, earlier this year. We think that the only 18 crowd is going to be bisected by ethnic groups. The, and most of them will, buy, will be anti-establishment, meaning they're not going to vote for the government party. They're going to vote for the other parties. So I think if you get Chinese voters likely will vote for the opposition, but the Malay voters will probably vote for the second strongest Malay party in their area whether it is uh, PAS or Perikatan, you know, so that's going to be a possible scenario. So we're, we're going to have a very contested election. Uh, in your opinion, when will that election be? Uh, well, I mean, nobody knows, you know, it depends on the prime minister and his party. You know, we've heard voices you know, following the media, you know, a lot of UMNO leaders are gung-ho. They want to have elections before Raya, you know, so that they can have Raya in Putrajaya. Uh, that can happen. <laughs> <laughs> so that can happen. Uh, but I think, you know, Kasi Chan for the Prime Minister, you know, he probably want to be PM for a bit longer, right? So I think maybe later next year, uh, if he has his chance, probably full term. Uh, but the Prime Minister is a part of AMNO and Barca National. So it would kind of make sense if the Malacca elections was a barometer that elections be held sooner or then later, don't you think? Yeah. It is, you know, but I think there are some dynamics inside the party because, you know, the, the people who ran the election in Malacca are the party leaders. Uh, the cabinet members, the ministers from AMNO, I think played less of a role, partly because I think they wanted to keep the temperatures down because they're still working in government together with Bersatu and PAS. So they didn't want it to be so conflict-ridden. Uh, but I, I think... Uh, depending on how the economic and the pandemic situation unfolds, I, I would uh, guess that it's more likely to have an election perhaps after the middle of next year. Okay. Are you in any position to talk about Sarawak? 
uh, a little bit. Yeah. I can, yeah, I can touch on that as best I can. Okay, let, let's spend a few minutes doing that. Uh, um, when is that scheduled for? Have they have they put it set it in stone? Yes, they have. Uh, so election commission has uh, already met uh, to discuss Sarawak, and they have uh, determined. I think the eighth of December to be the nomination day. So we'll know which parties are contesting, who the candidates are, and then election day is eighteenth of uh, December. So the weekend before Christmas. Uh, so not not too far away, perhaps just about less than a month away from now. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize actually. Isn't it yeah. amazing? We're, we're at the end it's of twenty December. Nomination right? is six of December. Yeah. So the campaign oh, period yeah. is very short, only about twelve days. Yeah. Sp- speaking of that, uh, I we I did speak to a couple of the candidates on my show prior to the Malacca election. And then it actually hit me that they weren't allowed to have the Chiramas with the Bratus Ratus Orang or Bribru. And it was all about literally going to warungs, step by step, you know, makan and tetare 15 times a day at the warungs. Yeah. Uh, did this did this new norm, do you think, uh, have any kind of effect? And who does it, who does it give advantage to and who does it disadvantage? Uh, I think, number one, it clearly disadvantaged the opposition. Because, you know, we know Why? from eating elections for so long, right? Oppositions tend to be a, a bit less well resourced, lah. you know, funding-wise, a bit less and all that. So they rely on Cerama to reach out to people. So you have big Cerama and uh, Lim Guan Ying will speak. There will be like 8,000 people there. And then it lifts up the mood, you know. Uh, and people will go home and speak to their relatives and family members. And that, uh, I think, drives the election. And it also drives the narrative, like what's the story? about this election, you know, give meaning to the the voters' participation in that event. But without this drama, there's no oxygen, lah, you know, so there's nothing to talk about. There's no entertainment, there's nothing there. And instead, uh, what has happened is uh, all of these candidates have to send WhatsApp, you know, or SMS or WhatsApp. Yeah. And you know how WhatsApp is like, right? I mean, you probably get hundreds of WhatsApp messages a day. I get hundreds of messages. So it just goes down the... It just goes down the 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 the, the role, and most people don't uh, don't open it, you know. Uh, so it benefits the party with some resources because they can maybe produce better videos. They can have a media team that can produce some content that's relevant and maybe humorous and makes people want to share. Uh, so that's I think about the only advantage that uh, stronger, better resource parties can bring, but. In all, it, it really, it really reduces the temperature of this election, and it really makes it very difficult uh, to articulate your agenda, and also very hard to tell stories. You know? Actually, now that you say it that way, that actually makes sense because uh, the the energy, um, the vibe of a huge crowd getting together can really multiply. Uh, exponentially, especially when, you know, a certain uh, message is being sent out. And uh, it is actually much, it is a very enrolling tactic when you have, you know, a thousand or eight thousand people there that you actually can get caught up in the yes. game or, you know, and, and suddenly think to yourself, oh, wow, this is who I have to support. So, yeah, you have a point there. Whereas this new tactic of going on the ground and pergi ke warung, ke warung, ke warung, talking to tables of five to ten to twelve people, um, is much less effective if you are trying to pass a message that is trying to break the current system. So, uh, do you think that will have a bearing in Sarawak? Oh, certainly. I mean, in Sarawak, it's going to be really tough because I'm not sure. It's a huge place. Know, in, yeah, it's number one. It's a huge place. You know, in the urban centers, you know, Cerama is still uh, used to be the primary way of getting the message out. Uh, now, if they are not allowed to have Cerama, yeah, they go house to house. I mean, I saw last year Sarawak, uh, sorry, Sabah state elections and they still had Cerama then and then we had the super spreader events, lah, you know. So I, I could understand that the authorities will uh, want to be more cautious uh, with this now that we have this new uh, variant out. Uh, so we are not going to have big events and, and this is just going to, uh, I think, take the energy out of an election. And... The other issue is in Sarawak, you have many rural areas, longhouses and villages. I'm not sure whether the villages will 
welcome uh, campaign parties to go there and um, you know speak to them because they might be scared as well. So we do know that in some longhouses, you know, they've been very restrictive in terms of outsiders wanting to come in because they don't want their uh, households to get sick and they're far away from medical help if they run into problems. Okay, so uh, just as you're saying that, you know, Ayman Safwan has commented, uh, GPS, which is pro BN uh, and PN, PBS is pro PHDP and PHDP in Sarawak may cause a divide in the number of of voters in Sarawak. APBS puts reps, same as DAP, Adun Pat. So uh, I, I got to say, that's too many letters for me to make sense of. Yeah. I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm almost feeling like I'm dyslexic now. <laughs> what, what, what do you think about... It is obviously yeah. a whole different game. In yeah, situation. I mean, the situation in Sarawak has become, you know, more, more interesting in the sense that in the past, you have, uh, you know, the what used to be BN Sarawak, which is now... GPS, Gabungan Parti Sarawak. So the Sarawak parties lah, the, the parties that are uh, ruling the state right now. And then you have the opposition parties, which are largely from Peninsula. PKR, DAP, Amana, you know, they're still running there. But uh, now there are new parties uh, on the block, which is from uh, Sarawak itself. Actually, these are splinters from PKR, uh, where, you know, they bergado and then they left, and now they form their own parties, you know. Uh, so, and then... The, the original parties are still going to contest the same seats. So all the votes are going to be split up. I would imagine that in Sarawak, the GPS voting block is pretty much solid. So GPS or formerly BN Sarawak will still have their support base. So those guys are there. But the opposition side, just like what happened in Malacca where Perikatan, you know, with PAS and Bersatu split away, that's going to take some of the votes as well. So I think the chances for some of these PH parties, particularly PKR and Amana, is going to be very, very tough, you know, in the non-Chinese areas of Sarawak. So maybe DAP can still survive, but the other parties are going to have a very tough time because their votes are going to be split up. Okay. Uh, just on a... I have no stats about this, but I have spoken to a lot of friends uh, from the Chinese community who at least the ones that I spoke to living in the Klang Valley area, said that, uh, you know, they are, are inverted commas, fed up with Pakatan and, you know, are, are pulling away. Um, is that the vibe you're getting? Is that, are the stats showing you that as well? Yeah, there's some, some of that. You know, the thing is, you know, when we ask people about how they feel about political parties, you know, like most people are fed up with political parties. The younger the voter, the more fed up they are. They're fed up with nearly <laughs> all politicians, you know. But the thing is, you know, when elections come, I think we Malaysians are very dutiful, you know, uh, in the sense that we, we are going to perform our duties as citizens. We will panka something, lah, you know. So at that point, I think for some voters, I think majority of them are still going to show up to vote. Maybe not as high as it was before, not in as high numbers as it was in 2018. We had like 85, 86% turnout. I think in the future, because of pandemic, because of political fatigue, uh, we are going to see the numbers, I think, drop slightly. I, I can guess maybe 5%, 8% thereabouts. Uh, but I think the existing patterns are still going to be there. Because like, if you look at Malacca, right? Malacca is interesting because, uh, yes, DAP contested and they lost like four or five seats and they won uh, four seats. So a lot of people have been asking me, you know, did the Chinese voters go back to Barisan because MCA won two and MIC won one seat? So we went and looked at some of the data and what we found was this. Actually, the for the Chinese voters that showed up to vote, most of them still voted uh, DAP or PH the same way they did back in 2018. But it's just that much lower numbers showed up. Only 55% showed up. So... So it's not as if they voted for MCA or others. It's just that many Chinese voters didn't vote. Uh, but those that came out still voted for DAP up to 90%. So um, so there you go. You know, I think for yeah. voters who are fed up, maybe your Chinese friends who are fed up with PH, I think if they're really fed up, they probably wouldn't come out to vote. 
they probably couldn't okay. bring themselves to vote Barisan, but they might not come out to vote. Fair enough. Uh, Benjamin Chong says there'll be no change in Sarawak as the current government is doing a great job. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at what Sarawak government has been doing over the last several years, you know, uh, they have spent a ginormous amount of money on infrastructure, on rural roads, on water supply, on public transport. I think Abang Joe's uh, spending on public amenities, you know, each year is is a lot. Uh, so you know, five to five to six billion ringgit a year for the last three four years on on addressing public needs, uh, and even let's say dilapidated schools. You know, things that federal government should have fixed. You know, and the federal government is late in coming with funding. He came in and uh, did it himself. So. Uh, and the thing is, the state can do it because they, they have resources, they have huge reserves, <coughs> and so they are able to address some of these needs. And the other thing is, you know, uh, they've not really created a lot of controversy. You know, so they've not, we've not heard about, you know, any embarrassing corruption scandals or a- any bad things that has happened there. Pretty much, uh, they've been trying to work and address some of these issues. There's always going to be criticisms, but... You know, when we put things on the balance, I think they are doing more good things than bad. Okay, uh, let's 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 lean off the statistics for a while, uh, Ibrahim. If you were uh, an advisor to the prime minister, because right now the government got plenty of advisors, uh, they, they're opening up new advisory spots by the minute. <laughs> what would you be whispering into the ear? Of uh, uh, okay, we'll take it both sides. If you were on the side of uh, uh, the current government, what would you be advising them? And then I will ask you the other qu- the side of the question as well. So yeah, first of all, let's well, start. If, if, you I were to, yeah. if I were to advise someone in power right now and looking at what the country needs, right? We have large numbers of young people that are coming to vote for the first time. So this is the political dimension. The other dimension is uh, our economy. We are still trying to recover from the pandemic. A lot of people have lost jobs. A lot of our graduates are struggling to find work. And, and for many people, you know, the wages, we, we have the same problem what we see elsewhere in the world. Our wages, our salaries have not kept up with expenses. Uh, and if we look at the trend lines right now, uh, I think we are going to be facing, you know, uh, inflation problems. No harga barang. Now, people, if you look at the newspapers and, and social media, people are complaining about you know, roti gardenia mahal and all that. So that's the symptom. I think we need to address the problems. Uh, I would advise them to see, you know, what can we do to create job opportunities for younger people? And I think to start with, you know, how do we address our labor policy so that uh, we encourage companies to take on local workers, pay them better wages so that so that they can find work and then reduce reliance on imported labor. That, that, I think, is very, very critical. That's one. And then number two, this is my general advice to any politician out there. How do we keep more women in the workforce? Because women, you know, should be making up more than 60% of our workforce. But I think in Malaysia, is less than half these days. So a lot of women, they, they start work and then they start having families and then they never come back to work. So we lose experienced people, you know, uh, and, and we lose experienced people, we end up hiring others. Whereas if we kept women uh, in the workforce, they will gain experience, they will earn more money, they have more money to spend on their families, and in short, you know, make us more prosperous. Okay, uh, your, your suggestions as the, fa- the advisor are all very sound, uh, based on sound policies. But uh, like it or not, in Malaysia, when it comes to the election, it almost boils down to race and uh, the number of a particular race in that constituency. And that is just basically how our system is set up. If you are running in a place where there's 80% uh, Malay or slash Bumiputra, you just need to say what the Bumiputra want to hear. Similarly, if you're running in a place that has 80% in the Chinese community, to win, you just need to say what the Chinese community want to hear, rather than, as you have pointed out, 
things yeah. about policies, more women in the workforce, uh, you know, the salary um, breakdown and all. So yeah. we can talk about policies, but how do we navigate past this? Is it possible to navigate past the whole what race are you voting system? Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, I, I agree with you because that's how our electoral boundaries are being cut. You know, so we, we have a lot of these constituencies where you have Malays and non-Malays mixed up together and and then the politicians come up and fire up one group, you know, over the other to get their votes. Uh, that's still true, you know, uh, and there's no way that we can get our ways around it. But I think is this. My view is this. I think for younger voters, younger voters, I think, are more discerning because they have wider access to information. They have less of a... I would say less of a, the baggage of relying on on old track records, you know, of the political parties. I think the newer generation of voters are the me generation. They they want to know like what's in it for me, what can this politician, this political party, this government do for me, and I think this is where uh, leaders need to articulate these things because the race argument, you know, is undeniable. It's the basis for many of our politics, but to differentiate between uh, a party of the Malays to a better party of the Malays is the party that can convince the Malay voters down there that it can do a better job delivering the goods. And in the constituencies where the Malay vote is critical, that can be a clincher. And, and I want to bring this example, you know, for example, in uh, Selangor, for example, because we, we talk about race and politics. What we found in Malaysia is that the more Malay the constituency is, if you go to Terengganu or Kelantan or Kedah, the race card doesn't work because everybody's Malay in the constituency. So if you go to Kuala Neros and you bring the, uh, you know, I'm the Perwira Melayu argument, I'm the Malay champion argument, it doesn't run, you know, because everybody's Malay there. So what matters is, will this YB deliver that clinic or that bridge or that road uh, or that bantuan, uh, you know, compared to the other YB? People look at the deliverables. So as the electorate becomes younger and also more Malay, I think the pragmatic elements become more important. So younger voters can distinguish between that because they're not they're not always watching uh, TV Tiga or they're not always baca Udusan. They they get a lot of feedback from their friends, so they can they can discern these things. So I think uh, good candidates, uh, good ideas, can still sell and can still overcome a race and religious rhetoric. Okay, uh, you have uh, brought up the word younger voters three or four times in the last five minutes. Do you have the stats by uh, potentially when GE15 happens? What kind of different percentage of younger voters is going to be added into the, the, whole, the whole pot? Yeah, I, I roughly have that. Uh, I think we are going to get close to 7 million new voters come in. Wow. 7 million. So it's about 45% increase in our elect in voters, you know. So it's going to be a lot. Hold, hold on. 7 million who prior to this never voted before. Yes. Yes. So you imagine we had seven, 15 million voters now. You're going to have 7 million more come in. So it's going to be 22 million people voting uh, in the next GE. Well, just with that piece of statistic, I would be focusing 100% on that 7 million. Right. Yeah, precisely. They have to focus on that, you know, because the other voters are spoken for. You already know yeah. who they are. They've been voting, you know, for up in times. You already know who they are. These guys are voting for the first time. Uh, some of them are not 18, 19, 20. Some, some of them are 21 and above. They just didn't register last time, you know. Though that's maybe about uh, about 4 million people, about 3.5 million people thereabouts, and then the other half are people who are 18 to 21. So th those guys are really young. And then you have other people that were eligible, but they didn't register. But those are mostly young as well. Most of them are below 30 years old. So I would say out of the 7 million people, at least 6 million are young. They're below 30 years old. Did I hear you say earlier, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the younger voter stream would choose Prikatan rather than PH or BN. Uh, is, yes, is that for Malay voters? You, yes, yeah. that's what we found why, in Malaysia. Yeah, more of them. Yeah. Oh, 
okay, would you be able to explain it? Like, why? Yeah, like I said earlier, uh, what we've noticed, you know, from one election after the next uh, is that among younger voters, I'm, I'm segregating it by race, lah, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Chinese voters, young and old, vote, vote DAP, you know, but Malay voters, the older ones vote Barisan. The younger ones tend to vote for the non-establishment party. So if their area, the second strongest party is PH, they will probably vote for PH. If the second strongest Malay party in their area is PAS or Perikatan, they will give their votes to uh, that party in that in that area. So outside of, let's say, Selangor KL, I think most of these young voters, young Malay voters, may give their votes to Perikatan. May. I'm, I'm not sure, but the tendency seems to be moving in that direction. Ah, okay. Uh, I, I will hold you to that, and uh, I'll, I'll be watching that with a very, very keen eye. Yeah. So, here we go. Uh, I do this program called "What's Going on Malaysia" because basically, you know, I'm asking that question: What's going on Malaysia? Um, you're the stat man, but you have some very um, sharp and acute opinions about how it all plays out. Um, if 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 the election were to be held at GE15 earlier than later, by current wave and standards, who do you think would come out victorious as we stand at this moment? Um, you know, it's it's going to be a toss-up. Well, I think Barisan National will get more seats than Perikatan or, or, or Perikatan. Uh, yeah, partly because they have the machinery and all that. But I think they will be facing a tough contest in some of the Malay states. So if you ask me who's going to come out on top, my, my view is that we probably will not see uh, a majority being formed immediately. Like BN will get a chunk of seats. PN may get a chunk of seats. PH still can get a chunk of seats as well. So they will have to form a coalition after the election. That's that's sort of my my speculation right now. Uh, upon saying that, and just to my producer, if you can bring up this um, statistic, I actually did notice uh, going back to Malaki election that if PN and PH had had actually bergabung, they would have beaten out um, Barisan National. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know at, at the moment we go, oh, that will never happen, but. This is Malaysia. <laughs> I never know. I know. I never know you never thing. know. <laughs> yeah. So, potentially, could that well, happen? I mean, could... if we, we throw up a hypothetical situation, we speculate that we have uh, uh, a, a kind of a pack, you know, a kind of cooperation between the two groups, you know, where they don't contest okay. against one another in some places, then you might have uh, Perikatan take up quite a fair chunk of the Malaysia. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, for example, Machap Jaya, BN gets 3,700, PH 2,700, and PN 1,002. Now, if PH and PN had, you know, broke up, yeah. cooperated, uh, BN would have lost. And uh, if my producer can just click on any other. Uh, Hazak, could you just click on any others? Yeah, I can go to yeah, It's the same Once as well. Again, yeah. Same as well. Right. So, so if I, I was uh, PN, you earlier, that in this particular election, uh, Barisan National won so many seats with less than 50% of the votes. So if the two other guys had cooperated instead of fighting one another, they would have won. <laughs> oh my gosh. What a wonderful world we live in Malaysia. <laughs> uh, now, now I'm going to get even more confused. Okay, uh, <laughs> Ibrahim, uh, before we call this to an end, um, from a personal point of view, the non-statistic person, the non-Medeca center person, what, what is what is your hope uh, that for, for Malaysia and for the powers that be uh, moving forward? What 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 ideally what what do you wish could ha would happen? You know, I my view is that I think this uh, number one. I think we we need a stable government. So I want them to, you know, find common 
find common ground so that they can cooperate. You know, one way or another. Yeah, I don't really have any preference for what I, I want them to be able to form a stable government. You know, not a government that that have to be reformed every six months or one year. You know, nothing gets done. You know, so that's one. I I want that. And then number two, um, I want them to focus on on the things that we need to fix, which is uh, the economy, because you know. We have so many people that have uh, fallen into hardship because of COVID, you know, and and there's no there's no foreseeable end yet, you know, because we have all these new variants, lah, and all that. So uh, a lot of people are facing a tough time. So if the politicians are fixated on politics and not towards addressing these uh, problems, you know, we will never get out of this hole, uh, and and it will take us a long time uh, to fix the country because as Politicians are bickering and all that. You know, business and life still goes on. People are still investing. People are still buka kedai factories and all that. And they look at Malaysia and they think that, oh, you know, these guys can't get their act together. I'll go to Vietnam lah. I'll go to Thailand, you know, even though it's a military junta, but at least it's predictable. Uh, so they need to get these things sorted out and address the differences. Because at the end of the day, the ideological differences between a lot of these parties are very, very minimal. You know, the differences are small. You know, if they can sign an MOU with one another so that they can get things moving, you know, why can't they find ways to cooperate? So, because it's a, it's a waste. We are, we're losing a lot of time. We've lost, we've lost time, you know, for, as a country and momentum. We've lost since the middle of 2015 and until now. If this next election... We can't get our act together and have a strong, stable government. We we'll lose another five years, and then, you know, we we will be left behind by our neighbors, and our young people will end up working as fruit pickers in Australia or become managers in Indonesia because they are growing, they are pulling ahead of us. Uh, I am in agreement with you on that. Uh, the worst case scenario is that Malaysia goes down a certain road, where one day. Uh, all the investments are pulled out, put into other countries, and we end up being the country where our women workforce, instead of being working in the government, are being sent overseas to other countries to work as maids. Uh, and, you know, you may scoff and laugh at that at the moment, but uh, I, I agree with you. If we don't get our stability in hand and uh, the economics right, we, we could slip further down. And like you say, we don't have another five years to stop that. Uh, it could be too late. With that, uh, uh, Ibrahim Sofian, thank you so much for, for being a guest on my show. Before we leave, is there, any, is there anything you want to bring up? Is there anything that you want to mention that we have not talked about or, or something that you would like to stress again? Well, I, I think I just wanted to speak to your viewers, especially those uh, younger ones, those who have brothers and sisters who may be voting for the first time. Get them involved. You know, talk about these things because this is not just about politics, but this is our country, it's our home, and uh, we can fix this. You know, I'm I'm confident we can fix this, but everybody needs to be involved. Don't lose hope in Malaysia. Don't lose hope in Malaysia. I, I like that. It's going on a T-shirt. Thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim Sufyan. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you for you. your insights, and above all, thank you for. Uh, just, just being there and keeping an eye on things. And I'll definitely have you back as a guest on my show, maybe after the Sarawak elections. No problems. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thanks, Harris. Good Thank luck. you. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Itu dia Encik Ibrahim Sufyan from Medica Center, uh, the center that looks um, over research and opinions about uh, over elections and uh, where the Malaysian people stand and, and why they do what they do from a statistical point of view. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in, for listening in. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, once again, this episode. If you have not shared it so far, please click on the sharing link. Uh, thank you, Ayman Safwan. We just want stability. Yes, uh, I appreciate so much your comments. Um, a lot of wonderful comments have been coming through. A lot of wonderful suggestions. Uh and uh, thankfully, not that many crazy arguments because sometimes uh, the comment section just tend to blow up with a little bit of uh, animosity. That be not tonight. Guys, 
as I said earlier, I do the show What's Going On Malaysia because I basically am asking that question, uh, looking for the answer to that question, What's Going On Malaysia. Um, tonight, at least from a statistical point of view, uh, I have received some clarity. And the most interesting point I take from this session is that in the next GE17, there will be seven, potentially seven million new voters under the young category. Seven million. That's almost 45% of eligible voters. So with that knowledge in mind, if I was uh, a member of a political party, I would be pressing uh, to deal or to handle or to recognize the issues, the desires, the wants and the needs of that young voter. Because 7 million is a lot of people who can shift a lot of power and momentum. Wow! Amazing news. I'm, I'm going to be looking into that in my next episode. Uh, guys, we are back. It's it's the endemic. Uh, uh, just to let you know a little bit of a uh, little bit of the promo here. My uh, comedy club, the Joke Factory, is open again. We're doing live shows uh, next week. I just like to let you know we've got a few shows coming up on Wednesday. We have the improvised comedy show, making shit up, happening at the Joke Factory uh, on Thursday. We have uh, the. Is it on Thursday? Yes. No, on Thursday we have a show called Fresh Faces, uh, headlined by Matt Sabah. And also on Friday and Saturday we have the divas of comedy, Joanne Kam and B.B. Capo. So if you're a fan of live comedy, please check out The Joke Factory, uh, both on Instagram and Facebook. Um, it's the best place for a laugh. And God knows we need to laugh, not just tonight, but every week. Because... Uh, if things continue the way they continue, <laughs> we may not be have much to laugh about after all. So, Tuan Tuan and Puan Puan, Skali Lagi, Trima Kasi, thank you, Yosef Chong, for watching and thank you for your kind comments. Uh, my name is Harith Skanda. Um, I will be coming back with a very interesting episode of What's Going on Malaysia. I'm just lining it up right now with, uh, with who you may ask. Well, let's just put it this way. I don't know if you have read the news, but... Uh, is something called a better Malaysia Assembly is being proposed by uh, Tan Sri Nazir Raza, uh, signed by 54 uh, people, including myself. Uh, and I will be having members of that better Malaysia Assembly uh, on the show. Not just one show, but perhaps many, many shows to talk, to talk about how we can create a better Malaysia in the very near future. So as we roll out of today's show, once again, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And I'm going to leave you with a comedy clip, a comedy promo from the upcoming show next week on at the Joke Factory Live. BB uh, Capo and the wonderful Joanne Campopo. Not for everyone's taste, but definitely hilarious. So we'll roll out with this promo, and that is the end of the show. Guys, I'll see you soon. Man, you know, can you imagine you're one as you mind, then you buy the bra, then look like Mexican bar, okay, and then you go lancing, then you're like, oh, 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 then the guy will love you, okay, okay, Pamelo, Pamelo, take out, ah, like that only. <laughs> What's worse, uh, can you imagine the man come back, take out his t shirt, you take off your bra, you both turn around, his tete bigger than your tete. The father was saying, wow, this one I tell you, if I enroll him in a martial arts school, he will grow up. He will be Jackie Chan. Yeah, now that didn't work, like you know, because I came out as Mulan. <laughs>